I was asked to offer concluding remarks. I think I should just say thank you for coming and there's refreshments outside. <laughs> Let me offer a few thoughts. Um, now, I have to apologize. I don't have a PowerPoint. I'd like to say I don't have a PowerPoint because I just got to listen to this and decide while I was sitting here what I was going to say, but I don't know how to use PowerPoint anyway. I've never done a PowerPoint in my whole life. Um, and I guess like Benjamin, I have to say I'm a lawyer and not a psychologist. And so that's the perspective that I want to speak from for a few minutes. Um, what these presentations tell us about the law and the legal system, and especially some of the really most important underlying problems with regard to the law and the legal system. And I think what I can do is take the presentations, I'm going to speak with them out of order, and say that you can really look at a continuum of what goes on in law and the legal system from what's said. From You can talk about, well, what are the problems in terms of What's the appropriate focus, especially of the criminal law? And you're about, well, once we have a criminal law, what are the problems with regard to investigations, especially investigations with regard to crimes against children? And once there's investigation completed and there's trial, I think some of the presentations heard are, what are the problems with regard to trials in the legal system? And then you can talk about, well, once we're done with that phase of the criminal justice system, what are the problems that we face in terms of how to punish people within the legal system, especially how we punish children. And then finally, you get the underlying question of, well, how do you enforce things within the legal system? What I want to suggest is some interrelationships among the presentations. If you look at these five questions, and you look at them as really a continuum from the beginning to the end, or what's more likely, a process that is cyclical and circular. Um, let me just say a few words about each and what the presentations raise for us to think about in terms of these underlying problems in the legal system. I said one thing that they raise is the problem of, well, what's the appropriate focus of the law and especially of the criminal law? And here I go to Professor Ditto's presentation in terms of what's the relationship between our moral judgments and what's appropriate for the criminal law to punish. And here I want to focus on a Supreme Court case from a little over a decade ago when you might be familiar with a case called Lawrence versus Texas. Texas had a statute that prohibited private, consensual, adult, homosexual activity. The statute called this a crime against nature. And the question was, did it violate the Constitution for the state to punish such private, consensual, adult, homosexual activity? Texas's argument to the United States Supreme Court was that the state could make a moral judgment that homosexual behavior is wrong and thus criminally punish this conduct. And the issue before the Supreme Court was, is this a sufficient justification to make such laws constitutional? And the Supreme Court, 6 to 3, declared the Texas law unconstitutional, rejecting the moral justification as being inadequate as a basis for the law. But then the question is, if this moral justification is insufficient for the law, what about other laws that rest on a moral justification? Think of laws against prostitution. Maybe we could make a public health argument against them. But isn't it really that they're based on a moral judgment that it's wrong to sell sex for money? Or what about laws that prohibit gambling? Aren't they really based on a moral justification? Or what about laws that make consumption of drugs with a person just hurting himself or herself a crime? Well, isn't that based on a moral justification? How much of the prison population today is for people for these crimes, especially drug crimes? And so don't we really, if we're going to think about morals in the law, need to focus on when is a moral justification for a law sufficient as a basis for it, and when should we say the moral justification isn't sufficient for it? It certainly can't be that we're going to let the Supreme Court decide which moral judgments they like and which they don't like. There's got to be some principle here, and that's why I think your research about morality and the law is so important. Well, assume that we've made the decision that there's going to be a criminal law. Then there's going to have to be an investigation about the criminal law. And if you think of that as sort of a second step in this continuum we've been talking about today, and especially uh, here is what Professor Cross was talking about in terms of investigations concerning children. And it was fascinating to hear, hear her talk about that there's not only a problem of false accusations by children, but also false denials by children. Now, traditionally, the legal system has been much more concerned with false allegations than with false denials. 
That's because we have a legal system that's always believed it's much better to let 100 guilty people go free than to convict one innocent person. And a false allegation could lead to somebody being wrongly incarcerated. Yet there are also costs to false denials in that guilty people won't be punished. They then remain free to continue to commit the crime. And the less we're punishing the guilty, the more we're going to undermine effective enforcement, going to Professor Van Roy's comments at the very end. As I was listening to Professor Kwasi, I was fascinated to think about, is it really possible to decrease false denials without increasing false accusations? That if we decrease false denials, isn't there really a danger that we're going to be giving more weight to those who are making false allegations? And then the question is, can we design a system that will simultaneously decrease false allegations and also false denials? And how does our current system create biases in this regard? I worry, for example, that investigators of child abuse inherently have a bias towards finding abuse rather than a bias against finding abuse, because that's where they come from. You had up on the screen the People magazine cover McMartin Preschool. The investigators began with the assumption that there was abuse, and then they were able to get testimony about that. And can we create a system that will effectively separate the false from the true allegation? Well, especially when you're dealing with children, can we adequately cross-examine children to get at the truth, or is the allegation often sufficient as a basis for the crime? And so the investigation phase becomes very important, and it immediately, to me, goes to the third phase, which is what Professor Loftus was talking about. From my perspective, it's, well, what about the problems at trial? Now, you could certainly take what Professor Kass was talking about in terms of children and their testimony at trial, but I think also in terms of what Professor Loftus said about, there's the much more general problem of when witnesses testify at trial about what they've seen or heard or remember, they have tremendous weight with juries. Now, perhaps children less so, but I don't think that's necessarily so. Definitely when you're dealing with adults, when the witness is on the stand and says, that person who's the defendant is the one who did the crime, that's tremendously powerful in leading to convictions. As Beth said towards the end, we know of hundreds and hundreds of innocent people who are convicted on the basis of faulty testimony. Then I think the problem for the legal system is how can we better identify when somebody is testifying truthfully or falsely? The usual ways of dealing with this, trying to shake the memory of the person don't work for exactly the reasons that Professor Loftus says. The person has come to truly believe that his or her memory is accurate, even if it's a false memory. So the usual way in which we try to impeach a witness isn't going to be successful in this regard. Now, I think this is a place where the Supreme Court really has failed. The Supreme Court went decades without dealing with a case that concerned eyewitness testimony and identifications. The Supreme Court had a case just a couple of years ago about this, Perry versus New Hampshire. This involved a woman looking out of a room and seeing a suspect in the parking lot and then later testifying at trial that the person she'd seen in the parking lot was the defendant. Well, it was obviously very suggestive. There was only one person in the parking lot. It was who she remembered. It wasn't as if even it was a lineup where she was choosing someone from the lineup. And should we really give such weight to uh, recollection that was an observation from a distance and an observation in a, a dark evening. And the Supreme Court in an eight to one decision said, no problem. Since the police didn't do anything to create the suggestiveness, it doesn't violate the Constitution. Only if the police themselves create the suggestiveness is it reason to be concerned. And yet doesn't Professor Loftus's research tell us we have to be very concerned about eyewitness identification in memories based on it, even if it's not the police creating the suggestiveness. Justice Sotomayor wrote a terrific dissent in which she relied on research from Professor Loftus and others to say, we now know of so many innocent people being convicted on the basis of false eyewitness identifications. Don't we have to do something with that problem? And yet the Supreme Court here didn't do anything about it. So if you continue along the continuum from what's going to be a crime to investigation to trial, you then get to, well, 
What about punishment? What kind of punishment is appropriate? Um, there are so many studies that show that over-incarceration in the United States means that we incarcerate more people than any other Western or developed nation and by an enormous margin. The first case I ever got to argue in the United States Supreme Court was on behalf of a man by the name of Leandro Andrade who was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 50 years for sling $153 with the videotapes in, from Kmart stores in San Bernardino, California. He received the sentence under California's Three Strikes Law even though he had never committed a violent crime. Prior to California's Three Strikes Law, no one in the history of the United States had ever received a life sentence for shoplifting. And so when I think of what Professor Kaufman talks about with regard to children, to me it's a part of a larger problem of over-incarceration in the United States. And it's important to think about how we've gotten to this point, why politicians are always willing to vote for longer sentences and harsher punishments, because they don't want to give the sound bite to their opponent at the next election saying this person's soft on crime. This is an area where the Supreme Court has begun to address some of what Professor Kaufman talks about, unlike the other places we've talked about, I don't think the court has. For example, the Supreme Court in 2005, in a case called Roper versus Simmons, says it's cruel and unusual punishment to impose the death penalty for a crime committed by a juvenile. In 2010, in a case called Graham versus Florida, the Supreme Court said it's cruel and unusual punishment to impose a sentence of life without parole for a non-homicide crime committed by a juvenile. And then just a couple years ago in Miller versus Alabama, the Supreme Court said that generally it's cruel and unusual punishment to impose life without parole even for a homicide committed by a juvenile. At least there cannot be a mandatory sentence of life without parole for a crime committed by a juvenile. So I think this is the recognition of what Professor Kaufman is talking about. In fact, in all three of these cases, the majority opinions for the Supreme Court, and the first two were by Justice Kennedy and the last by Justice Kagan, rely very much on the difference between the adult brain and the juvenile brain, and especially with regard to things like the impulse control she's talking about. So I think there, there, there's certainly progress being made. The final thing we've been talking about today is with regard to, well, how do we enforce laws? How do we gain compliance with laws? And here, it's not only what Professor Van Roy was talking about, but also to tie it together with what some of the other speakers were talking about. I think one of the things to take from listening today is that both under-enforcement and over-enforcement of the law can really be a problem. Under-enforcement of the law can be a problem if we're dealing with children not making accusations of child abuse when child abuse really occurred. We're under-enforcing the law. Under-enforcement of the law can be a real problem if environmental laws aren't properly enforced, if food safety laws, to use Benjamin's example. But over-enforcement of the law can also be a problem if we're imprisoning people wrongly because of mistaken identifications and false memory, if we're punishing people too much. That's over-enforcement. And I think the question then is, how do we know what's the proper balance between over-enforcement, under-enforcement? And here, I wonder if Professor Ditto's research isn't crucial in telling us that ultimately it comes down to moral judgments that tell us what's over-enforcement versus under-enforcement, which then forces us to think about, well, which are the moral judgments that should be given away and which not in deciding what's over and under-enforcement? And so as I listen to these presentations, I realize that what they've done is illuminate some of the most important problems in the criminal justice system and law more generally. And so if you haven't come to law school, if you get to come to law school, these are the things you'll get to focus on. Thank you. Of course, it's very hard to follow Dean Chemerinsky, and I can't thank him enough for his thoughtful comments, for integrating this discussion for us, and for being here tonight. And I would normally open up the floor for questions and comments, but I am keeping you from a nice reception and wine that we have out there. And I thought, if you would like, please join us out in the lobby area. We will be having um, wine, uh, hors d'oeuvres, and we would love for you to join us and ask questions. Please come up to the speakers. But before we break, I do want to thank again the School of Social Ecology and the Newkirk Center for making this possible. And of course, the wine and the hors d'oeuvres is also to be thanked by them as well. So as we all take part and thank tonight, but also to thank all the speakers tonight for their amazing talks, uh, for staying on time, and for being just um, 
the first showcase of our Psych and Law faculty. To let everybody know, in the fall, we will have five more speakers from our uh, Center on Psychology and Law Speaking, and we really do hope you will enjoy um, and join us, because we are starting to lift off the Center. We want to really come and bridge with the community and help bring what we're doing here at UCI out into the community and out to you. So please join us for this reception, but thank you again, and thank you all for coming.